Good morning again. It's good to see you. I got a question for you this morning. Uh, It should be an easy one to start with. Um, Y'all want to have some fun this morning? Y'all want to have a good time at church or y'all just want to be bored the whole time? Y'all want to have a good time? All right, good. Uh, So let me ask you a a kind of a funny question, but a serious question. It goes with today's sermon. How many of you have a mama? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Most of you. So, um, (laughs) you know, some people are still asleep, but we'll, we'll get them. We'll get them before this is over. How many of you, um, how many of you remember the day you were born? (laughs) Nobody? Okay. I don't, I don't remember either. I was going to ask you what it was like because I couldn't recall. You know, when, when you were born, um, we commonly say that, 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 that you're delivered, right? You've, you've heard that. I delivered the baby. Um, the, you know, how, however, it goes with a lot of different phrases. And, um, and that's really what happens, right? You move from the womb into the world. You're delivered. You're brought from where you were to where you are now. And for some of y'all, that was a long time ago. But for all of us, for every single one of us, there was a day we were delivered And then we commonly call that day our what? Birthday. How many of you remember your birthday? Raise your hand if you know your birthday. Because this is important. This is where the fun part starts. Y'all thought we were having fun already. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little exercise. In just a second, I want everybody to stand up. And I want you to find somebody, hopefully nearby you, who doesn't already know your birthday. And I want you to, so don't go to your husband or your, well, maybe he doesn't know, but (laughs) maybe you need to remind him, but don't go to you, don't go to somebody, you know, your kids or your mom or whatever, like go find somebody that probably doesn't know your birthday. And I just want you to tell them your birthday. I just want you to say, I was born on May, whatever, whatever, and the year, whatever, whatever. Give them the year. Yeah. Everything. I want you to tell them everything. This is church. We're family. We should know these things about each other. So I want you to say, I was born on, and I want you to give them the month, the day, and the year. And then whoever you're talking to, your response when they finish is just simply this. That was a great day. Because it was. Because that's the day they were born. And then I want you to share your birthday with them. And we're going to do that a little bit with each other, all right? So you're going to give the birthday, and then you're going to say, that was a great day. And you're going to smile like this. That was a great day. Like you believe it, okay? And then you're going to tell them your birthday, and then you're going to find somebody else and do it. Easy enough? That'll be fun. All right, let's stand together. I'm going to come down off the stage and do this with y'all. If you're online, do it if you can, if you're with anybody, all right? You head back to your seats. You want to find yourself in the book of Colossians in the New Testament. Colossians chapter 1 is where we're going to be today. See, that was fun, wasn't it? It wasn't that painful. It wasn't that bad. And think about how many great days are represented in this room already. Here's the thing about your birthday. Your birthday is significant. It's important. It's one of the very first things you memorize as a kid, at least most of us do right? You can even ask little kids what their birthday is and they'll, they'll be able to tell you or they'll be able to tell you how old they are because they're, or they'll be able to tell you when their next birthday's coming up because they're looking forward to that day because that's a great day when you're a little kid, when you have a birthday. But we mark time by our birthdays because it's that significant in our life. Um, we're identified by our birthday. How many of you have ever been to the pharmacy to pick up a prescription? Okay. You go to the pharmacy to pick up a prescription, what do they say? What's your name and what's your birthday? Because it helps them identify you. Same in a doctor's office, same in a governmental office. If we took the time this morning to get everybody to pull out their driver's license, to double check and make sure you gave us the right year a minute ago, (laughs) if we took the time to do that, you would notice it's stamped on your government ID. Because it helps identify you. It is significant. Your birthday is significant. Not only was it a great day, it was a significant day. A significant day for you 
and a significant day for everybody around you. That was a significant day for your parents. It was a significant day for your siblings. It was a significant day for your friends, both then and now. It was a significant day even for this church that you would join decades, decades, and decades later because that's the day, the day you were delivered from the womb to the world is the day it all started for you. Without that day, you wouldn't be here today, would you? It's significant. The day you were delivered into this world was one of the most significant days of your life. And here's what I want to submit to you this morning. The day you were saved and delivered from this world is even more significant. Now, you won't find the date of your salvation stamped on your driver's license. They're not going to ask you for it when you go to the pharmacy to pick up your medicine or when you go to the doctor for a visit. But I'm telling you, that date is stamped in eternity. And it is the most significant day of your life, even more significant than your birthday. Because you were delivered on that day by the blood of Jesus for significance. Today we're going to look at Colossians 1, 9 through 13 as our main text, but I want us to briefly look at verses 3 through 6 for some context of where Paul's coming from in the text we're going to look at today. Here's what he says in Colossians 1, 3 through 6. He says, we always thank God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. For we have heard, he says, of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. You have already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. It is bearing fruit and growing all over the world just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. The day you were saved. So Paul's thanksgiving here was for a people who had been saved by the blood of Jesus, a a people who had accepted the gospel into their life. His thanksgiving was based not on their good works or not on their deeds or or not on what they could accomplish for the kingdom. His thanksgiving was, was there because of their acceptance of the gospel, because they had had that significant day, that significant moment in time where their names were etched in the Lamb's book of life and their eternal birth dates were written down. And as a result, he writes things like this. We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, because without that, what is there to be thankful for? And of the love you have for all the saints, and that comes out of the goodness of the gospel and the transformation that happens through it. And then he says, because of the hope reserved for you in heaven, a hope that is only for those who know the power and the truth of the gospel and who have confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then he goes on and he says, you have already heard about this hope. This isn't a new word for them. It's not a new message. You've already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel, he says, that has come to you. This gospel is not going to come to the Colossians. It's not in the process of arriving. No, he says it has come to you. It's already there. You've already accepted it. And they're doing something with it. They, they didn't just hear it and accept it and sit on it. No, they're, they're doing something with the gospel. He goes on and says, it's bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and come to truly appreciate God's grace. You see, the significance of their spiritual deliverance, their spiritual delivery had nothing to do with them. The significance of it was the work of the gospel itself. It was the work of the cross. It was the work of Christ in their life. Now jump down with me, if you will, to verse 9, where we pick up our main text for today. We're going to read 9 through 14, and we'll come back, and we're going to see six 
significant things that we all need to know about our salvation. It says this, for this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We're asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. There's six significant things I want to point out to you today. But the main idea, the big blank in different colors at the top of your bulletin says this, your deliverance is significant. You need to remember and recall as we walk through these six things that the fact that God has delivered you is significant. The first reason it's significant is because the day you were delivered from death to life is the day you gained divine guidance for your life. Point number one is the word guidance. The day I was delivered in Jordanton, Texas, I was blessed with great guidance. It wasn't the nuns, y'all, who ran the hospital at that time who gave me the great guidance as a baby. I'm sure they were great people. But I was blessed with great parents who became my guides for life. Amen? Amen? I was blessed with some great grandparents who became guides for my life. I was blessed at that moment, not even knowing it. I was like the rest of y'all, all gooey and slimy and crying and ready to go to sleep. But I was blessed in that moment with aunts and uncles that I didn't even know yet who would become great guides for my life. And others that would become my teachers and my friends and my peers and my mentors, who I, I didn't even know were going to come into my life, but, but I was blessed right then and right there with some great guides for my life. I didn't ask for these guides. I didn't work for these guides. I, I didn't pay them to be my guides. They were given to me on the day I was brought into this world. They were given to me as a gift from God on the day I was delivered from the womb to the world. Now, I realize when it comes to the human guides that we are given, some of us receive great guides and great guidance. I was fortunate to be one of those. But I know some of you didn't. Some of you were born into situations where you didn't have good guides. Some of you maybe were born into a situation where you didn't feel like you had any guide at all. Not everybody has great parents. Not everybody is blessed with a great family or great friends to guide them in those formative years of our life. But our spiritual deliverance, our spiritual delivery is different. Because while we're all born into different families, when we are delivered from this world that we live in, when God delivers us from the darkness and from the pit and puts us into the light and into his kingdom, we don't all get different families, we all become a part of the same family. And as a part of that, we all get the same guide. The guide I got the day I was spiritually delivered is the same guide you got the day you were spiritually delivered. We call him the Holy Spirit. He becomes our guide for life the moment we're delivered. You see, we don't just get his power, we also get to receive his guidance through our lives. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 Paul doesn't mention him by name, but here's what he says and what he's getting at. He says, for this reason also, since the day I heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We're asking that you may be filled. He says, we're asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk a life that is worthy of the Lord. Right? And then he goes on to say, Bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. 
How, how do we grow in the knowledge of God? How do we get filled with the knowledge of God? How do we get that guidance? Paul doesn't specifically here mention the Holy Spirit, but he's certainly pointing to the work of the Spirit in our lives. Because this doesn't happen without the Spirit's work in our lives. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we learn that the Holy Spirit enters into a person's life on the day they're delivered from their sins into salvation. In Acts 2, 38 through 39, it says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And he says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. At that moment, we all get the same gift. We all get the same guide. We all are invaded by the Holy Spirit. And he becomes the guidance we all need and the guidance we want. Not the guidance we'll always listen to, but the guidance is there for all of us. It's the same for me and the same for you. In Ephesians, Paul wrote this in chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. He says, In him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. He says, when you were delivered, when you came to know Jesus, when you were saved, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. With the gospel of your salvation, with the deliverance of that, you're sealed. And then he says, and when you believed. I mean, you can't miss this. He says, when you believe, when you confess, when you're delivered from your sins, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. And he says, the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit of God arrives and takes up residence in your life on the day you're delivered from your sin. Not on the day you're delivered from the womb to the world, but on the day you are delivered from the world to the kingdom of God. That's when the Holy Spirit comes and invades your life and seals you up for the day of salvation. Here's just one of the things Jesus himself said about the Holy Spirit in John 14, 26. He says, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've told you. He's going to guide you. He's going to be your counselor. The Holy Spirit is many times in scriptures referred to as a counselor or a teacher. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to you, sent to you to be your guide through this difficult journey we call life. Your deliverance is significant because the Holy Spirit comes into your life the day you're delivered. And we could all use the Holy Spirit, amen? I don't know what I'd do without him. Second reason it's significant is the word endurance. Colossians 1.11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance. You see, Paul recognized that this strength, this power, this great endurance was all according to his glorious might. You see, when you were delivered from your sin, into salvation, when you were delivered from your sin, you were born again, when you were adopted into the kingdom of God in that moment, on that day, at that time, by the king himself, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, that's a significant day. No matter how you look at it, but it's significant in part because on top of everything else, you're going to receive you're going to receive endurance. And you're going to need endurance to survive and to thrive in a sinful world, aren't you? An endurance and a hope that won't fade, an endurance and a hope that can't be stripped away, an endurance and a hope that is bigger than anything else will ever be in your life. And this is an endurance church and a hope that is not available to those who are never delivered. It's an endurance and a hope that's not available to those outside of the gospel, outside of the kingdom, outside of the cross, outside of the blood of Christ. This is why the Apostle Paul, James, Peter, and many, many others would write things like this, Romans chapter 5, 3 through 5. 
And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Guess when he was given to them? The day they were delivered, just like you. The same gift, the same guide. You see, the love of God has been poured out into their lives. And as a part of that deliverance, they received an endurance that got them through some difficult days. If we had time, we could read a ton of texts on this point. But here's what I want you to understand. The gospel for them was was not a dream. The gospel was not a thought. The gospel was not a theory. The gospel was not an opinion. It was a reality, a reality that they had been born again, that they had been delivered from the world, the sinful world in which they lived, into salvation by the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, and the blood he shed on the cross. And with that comes an endurance that the world will never be able to comprehend or know of because they don't have it, and they never will, because it only comes to those who are delivered. You see, your deliverance is significant. There's a third reason your deliverance is significant. It's mentioned in verse 12. The word is inheritance. Inheritance, the day I was born and the day you were born, we both received an inheritance from our earthly families. We received it by joining the family. We became entitled on that day, in that moment to whatever inheritance comes along with being a part of that family. Now, for some of us, we're going to get to inherit a bunch of great memories, some great moments, some great wisdom. Maybe we get to inherit a great name and carry it on, and that's about all we're going to inherit. And then others might get to inherit some level of material wealth or financial blessing in their life. We don't all get the same inheritance. Different families have different inheritances. Amen? Have y'all noticed this? The inheritance you receive will probably be different from the inheritance I receive. None of our inheritances are going to be the same. But it still remains that on the day we were born into that family, we received the right to be entitled to that inheritance. And the bottom line is this. Only those who are part of the family are eligible to receive the inheritance. Can we agree? Amen? Only those who are part of the family get to receive it. Abby and I have four kids. Most of y'all know we have three biological children and we have a son that we adopted. We have four children. Guess what? They will all receive the same inheritance. Not because they earned it, not because, certainly not because they deserve it. And, and not because I think they're going to need it. Do you want to know why they're going to get it? And you want to know why they're all going to get the same? Because they're all our children. They were born into our family, and that's how it works. You see, my kids won't receive an inheritance from you. Now, if you want to, they'll take it. <laughs> they could probably use it. They ain't getting much from me. But, but the reality is they're not going to receive an inheritance from you or your family, are they? And your kids are not going to receive an inheritance from me. I'm just going to break the bad news to y'all. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Because your inheritance comes from where? It comes from your family. And the day you were delivered on that great day that it was, was the day you became entitled to the inheritance not of my family, but of your family. Look what Paul says in verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. Church, can I just tell you there is no inheritance for those who remain in the darkness because they're not a part of the family. There is no inheritance for those who choose to remain outside of the kingdom and keep their distance from the king. There there is only an inheritance promised for those who are in the family of God, for those who come into the light and accept Jesus Christ 
as their Savior. Jesus said this in John 12, 46, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. If you choose to remain in darkness, don't expect a glorious eternal inheritance. It's not going to happen. You're not a part of the family. I love what the Apostle Peter wrote about our inheritance in 1 Peter 1, 3-4. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, not because you've earned it, not because you deserve it, not because you need it, because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Church, can I just remind you, you don't fall into an inheritance. You don't luck into an inheritance. And you certainly cannot buy your way into an inheritance. You don't earn your way into an inheritance. You're born into an inheritance. You're delivered into an inheritance. This is why Jesus told old Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Because if you are not washed in the blood of the Lamb, if you are not born again in the Spirit of God, then you don't have an eternal heavenly inheritance waiting for you because you have not been born into the family. You haven't been delivered. Jesus goes on in verse 5 of the same chapter, John 3. Truly I tell you, he's talking to Nicodemus still, truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. He says, do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. He says, this is the way it works. So if you have indeed been washed clean by the blood of the land, been made pure by the gospel, if you have been set apart as holy and reborn through the Spirit, then you have a great inheritance waiting for you. And my friends, that is significant. And that's why I keep telling you over and over and over again that your deliverance is significant. Next, look at verse 13 where we see our fourth point for today. It is indeed the word deliverance. Colossians 1, 13, he says, He has rescued us from the domain of darkness. I want to camp here for just a moment. The Greek word here is important. Several Greek words in this text that are very important, but the word for rescued is important. The word for rescued can can mean delivered. It can also mean, mean to be drawn to and saved. But most literally and most often it is translated with the word rescued. That's the most literal translation. It's a great translation. But I want you to understand that the idea in the Greek is, is not Not just that you're rescued from something, but that God rescued you for something. He didn't just rescue you from the world, he rescued you for a purpose. He drew you out of the darkness, not just for the sake of getting you out of the dark. He pulled you out of the pit, not just for the sake of getting you out of the pit. He rescued you from your sin, not not just for the sake of rescuing you. He drew you unto himself because he had a plan and a purpose for your life. He didn't just rescue you from it. He rescued you for it. He drew you to himself for a purpose. And this great rescue is what everybody is in need of from the moment they're delivered from their their, their mother's womb into this world. From the moment we are delivered from the womb into the world, we are in need of this rescue because we're all sinners from that moment we're born. And thus, we're all in need of a sinless Savior to rescue us from our sin. One commentator said it like this. He said, God drew us out of Satan's kingdom to himself, and that event was the new birth. We are not gradually or progressively delivered from Satan's power. When we placed our faith in Christ, we were instantly delivered. 
This is why the Bible says things like this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. And see, the new has come. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. You see, when the gospel rescues us, the job is done. It's finished. When God draws us unto himself and pulls us into the light and out of the pit, it's done. You've been rescued. It's why he says in verse 13, he has rescued us from the domain of darkness. It doesn't say he's in the process of rescuing us. He doesn't say he's going to come and rescue us someday in the future. He says he has rescued us. The job is done. He has drawn us to himself out of the darkness, into the light, out of the pit, into the kingdom. Out of the pit, into the promise. And then we find another Greek word here at the end of this text that is so helpful and so important. It's the word for domain. The word translated in your Bible and mine is is domain. And and what it really means is is jurisdiction. It means authority. So what this text is saying, what Paul is saying is when you were rescued by the work of the gospel on Calvary, when you repented from your sins and confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you were forgiven, the job was finished. You were moved always and forever out of the jurisdiction of the devil and into the kingdom of God. He's saying you're no longer in the devil's jurisdiction. You're no longer under the devil's authority. You belong to a different kingdom now. And I don't know about y'all, but I find that to be pretty good news. And that's why I keep telling you, your deliverance is significant. Because it is the final and only deliverance you will ever need for all eternity. When Jesus goes to work, he finishes the job. When Jesus went to the cross, he rescued you and he saved you once and for all. This leads us to our fifth reason why your deliverance is significant. It's the word transference or transfer. I like the word transference here. Look at the last half of verse 13. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. To the Thessalonians, Paul said, As you know, like a father with his own children, we encouraged, comforted, and implored each of you to walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So he rescued us, and he removed us from the jurisdiction of Satan, and he transferred us into his eternal kingdom. And not only did God do all of this work himself, by the way, just like your mother did, all of the, you didn't do nothing on that day you were delivered into this world. Your mama did all the work. Your daddy probably didn't even do anything. I'll be honest with you, the doctors don't do much. Your mama did all the work to transfer you from the womb into the world. And kind of in that same way, God did all the work. You didn't do any of it. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. But he did it. And he didn't just do the work, church. He did it while you were still a sinner. He made the choice to make you alive while you were still dead. I love the way the Apostle Paul says it to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. He says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. He's saying you you were dead, you were in the jurisdiction of somebody else. And he says, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also, but God. Despite all of that, 
But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, while we were dead, made us alive with Christ. He made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in our trespasses. He says, you are saved by grace. And he also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus because the job is done. He transferred us from where we were to where we are. So that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. What an incredible transformation God did for us through the gospel. We didn't do any of it. God did all of it. And he did it while we were dead. He did it while we were enemies. What an incredible work the cross of Calvary is for sinners like me. And to think I can be transformed and transferred into an eternal kingdom of God all by the work of the cross. Yeah, there's power in the blood. And your deliverance is significant. I want to close with this last one. This is number six. I told you we'd make it happen and get it done. Look at this, number six. It's the word assurance. You see, our deliverance is significant because it brings an assurance into our life that we can always hold on to. This is not a temporary deliverance. It's a permanent deliverance. Just like on that great day you were delivered into this world, that was pretty permanent, wasn't it? There's no going back to the way it was before. When you're born, you're here. When you're born, it's permanent. Can I just tell you this? When you're born again, when you're delivered from your sins, you can have the assurance that it is just as permanent. There's no going back. Look at verse 14. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Not we might have or we could have or we will have if we do this, that, or the other. Not we will someday have. Not if we give enough or work enough or serve enough or say enough right things. No, he says, in him, Jesus, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It is assured. You don't have to be a theologian to understand that. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Jesus is the only hope anyone has at redemption. Jesus is the only hope anyone has when it comes to the forgiveness of their sins. Jesus is the only one who can deliver you. And I'll say it again. Your deliverance is significant. So as we close, if you're delivered, if you have been delivered... If you are indwelled this hour by the Holy Spirit of God, then praise God. Be thankful like Paul was for these believers. Be grateful for the guidance you have in your life because of that deliverance. Be grateful for the endurance that is present, that's helping you every single day to make it through because of that deliverance. Be thankful and grateful for the inheritance that is coming your way because of that deliverance. Be thankful that you have been transferred out of a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light, that you have been transferred into God's family. And be thankful that you have the assurance that that can never be stripped or taken away from you. There's no going back once you're delivered. Be thankful for all of these things if you've been delivered, because your deliverance is significant. But if you have not been delivered... If you are not saved, if you have never repented, if you have never confessed, if you're listening to my voice right now and you know that you have never been spiritually delivered, then I would urge you to listen not to my voice, but for God's. And if God is calling you unto himself, my encouragement to you would be to repent, to confess, to believe, and to be delivered this day. And you will experience the most significant moment of your life since you were born back on your birthday. 
But unlike that one, you're going to remember this one. And you'll remember it for the rest of your life, the day God saved you, the day he delivered you. It will be the most significant moment and day of your life. I can't save you. Your mama can't save you. Your daddy can't save you. Your husband or wife can't save you. Your kids can't save you. Only God can do it, so you listen for his voice. And if he calls your name, come a-running. Let's pray. I want to give you just a moment to consider those words and to consider that challenge. And if you know this is the day you need to be delivered, I pray you would be. We're not going to ask you to raise a hand or come to the front or walk an aisle to be delivered. The deliverance you need is spiritual in nature, and so it's between you and the Lord. You're going to have to repent and believe and confess if you desire to be saved and desire to be delivered. So if that's you, we want to invite you to pray with us in the stillness of your heart. If you sense God calling your name this hour, drawing you unto himself, then pray with us. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would save me, that you would change me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would make me new, that you would make me whole. And Lord, somehow that you would take this broken, crusty, dirty, messed up life of mine and make it holy. Lord, I thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy and for calling my name today. Father, as we close this hour, we are all reminded of how significant our deliverance is. How significant it was, even if it was decades ago, it is no less significant this hour than it was the moment we first believed. How significant it is for the billions of people around the world who have yet to be delivered. How imperative it is for us as your church to be not only your hands and your feet, but your voice to carry the message of deliverance to the world so that they can be saved. Lord, give us the courage, the wisdom, the words, the boldness, whatever it is we need to do that. And help us every day to rejoice in the reality of the deliverance you have brought to us through the power of the gospel, through Jesus, your son. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask and we pray these things now in Jesus' holy name.